Good morning, New Holland. It's good to see you together. Um, if you have your Bible, you can open it up to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I have been in the book of 1 Corinthians. I think my count is up to uh, 35 uh, Wednesday nights I have been in 1 Corinthians. And uh, we are going to uh, finish up chapter 16. And when we came to this part of chapter 15, which is a great chapter on the resurrection, I told uh, those on Wednesday nights, I'm going to save this one little paragraph. I'm going to do it on Sunday morning because I knew we were going to be doing the Lord's Supper as well. Um, I, if I had a title, my, my son, when he posts uh, the videos on the website, he always says, Dad, what's the title? And I'm terrible at giving titles to sermons. Terrible at it. But if I had a title for today, it would be Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. Y'all remember that song? Give great, give thanks with a grateful heart. And I think we just came through the Thanksgiving season and, and we've, we've all been thinking about all the things that we're very grateful for, the things that God has done for us. But um, the, the Lord is the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament is very Jewish. And uh, in the first five books of the Bible that were written by Moses, it was uh, very much about how things should be done and things were to be done in a certain way. But there was always a meaning behind it. There were seven feasts that uh, there were seven official holidays that they had in the Jewish calendar. Let me go over those with you real quickly. The, the first one was the Passover. Everybody remembers when the children of Israel left uh, the slavery in Egypt and they were, they were taken out. And before they went out, there was the last plague, which was the uh, giving of the, um, uh, of the blood uh, of the lamb. And they would take the blood of it and put it over the, the, the doorway. And it, those who uh, were there and taking part of that there and offering that uh, lamb for the Lord... Uh, the, when the death angel came, he would pass over the house. This was the very most important one for them. And by the way, all seven of these are in Leviticus chapter 23. The first one, actually, uh, Passover is in verses 4 through 8. Now, on the next day was the beginning of what they called the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's in Leviticus 23, 6. And leaven... Uh, when they left Egypt, they, they didn't have time to put leaven in the bread, so they, they left it out, and it became a, a sacred thing to them because leaven in Scripture, in the Old Testament, always represents sin. So we need to have a life free from sin. We'll talk more about that in a moment. The third one is first fruits. When they entered into the promised land, they were to come and to take some of the crop that was already there that they didn't plant. It was just simply a grace gift to them, and they would take the first fruits of the harvest as a wave offering unto the Lord, and they would wave it unto God, and that was the, the, the first of the three uh, harvest feasts that were there to honor God and His provision. Then there was the Feast of uh, Weeks, or Pentecost. It began the day after, or excuse me, it began on Passover, and would continue seven weeks plus one day. Seven weeks plus one day, so seven weeks, 49 days. And then one day, which brought it to 50, which in the, you know in the Old Testament, 50 was always a very sacred number. It was the year of Jubilee, 50. Uh, at the end of 50 years, all your debts were taken away. Wouldn't that be great? Just forgiven, right? Uh, and then some of y'all would say, man, if I could just live that long, you know. But uh, that, that was a very important day, and we'll talk more about the significance of that in just a moment. Then they had the, the next feast, was, was the Feast of Trumpets, a feast of great praise and honor unto the Lord, the, to shout His praise, and the trumpets would blow. Then there was the Day of Atonement. It comes in the seventh month, the first day of the seventh month, and, and the Jewish calendar, and that's uh, Leviticus 16, but it's also in Leviticus 23, 26 to 32, where the lamb, the ox, the, the, uh, the goat, the, if you were too poor and you could just take some doves or some pigeons, and those could be offered as the atonement for sin. And then the last one, the last of the feast of the, uh, uh, that we talked about, which was the Feast of Tabernacle or the Feast of Booths. This would be the one that they would 
as they would, they would remember. It was a time of remembering what had been done for them. When God brought them out of the, the, the slavery in Egypt and into the wilderness, they lived in booths. They didn't have a, a lasting home. And they were to remember where God had brought them from. Wouldn't it be a great thing if we still had the, the meaning behind these that we would celebrate today? Do you think it's good every now and again that we remember where God's brought us from? Not take God for granted. The great grace of God that's there that we are just so very grateful for. We're, we, we love His grace. We love His mercy. But sometimes we take those things for granted. Now, some people will say, well, I'm not an Old Testament person. I'm a New Testament person. Well, just remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The things that were there were, to, were, were a, a, a foresight. They were there so that we would know about them. When you're told something before it happens, then when it happens, there's a, a assurance of it. And you know, the power of the prophecy is also in the power of the fulfillment of it. And it's always pointed at or directed towards something so that you would know that that, that future prophecy has the same power behind it. As he was in the past, he is today. And the promises that he has fulfilled and is fulfilling, he will continue to fulfill. So where we are, where we were born, where we live, we can look back on all the promises that Christ fulfilled. And we have the living Christ. He was resurrected. He is alive today. And we are looking forward to something that is to come. Now, it could happen at any moment. If you're a believer in Christ, it could happen today. And I'm not simply saying you have a heart attack. Uh, I do ask if you have a heart attack that you would please wait till after the service is over. But, but it, that could be the way that we go and see Jesus. If we live long enough, we will all go through the, the journey of death. The lowering, the end of one thing. And you have to have the end of one before you can have the beginning of the next. And before we can say goodbye to this earth, we need to make reparations for the next life. But, but if we, when we say goodbye to this earth, we can be ready for the next life. So the things that he came to fulfill have been fulfilled, are being fulfilled, and will be fulfilled. And that's the reason why Paul, when he came to this important scripture on the resurrection, took this little bitty paragraph and said something that I think is extremely significant to us. So if you would, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to be reading in verse number 20. We will start reading in verse number 20, God's holy word. But now Christ is risen from the dead. And all God's people said? Amen. And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, that is Adam and Eve in their sin, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those that are Christ in his coming, that's the second, then comes the end, very important phrase, we'll talk about that more in a minute when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Christ reigns, and there will be a day that he will put an end to all other rule and authority and power, and he will reign forever. Verse 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, and when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he put all things under him is accepted. 
And when he has all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, that is God, who put all things under him, that is Christ, that God may be all in all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we came to worship you. We came to recognize and to praise you for who you are, for how you've always been there. You've always done that which is right. You've always gave, given us an example, a direction. You have pointed to truth, pointed to yourself. Jesus, you were willing to come, and you did. You lived the humble life. You preach the truth to them. It has been recorded for us. You willingly gave yourself as the offering, the offering that would pay the penalty of our sin so that we could know you in a real way forevermore. And Lord, you sealed it and you've kept it. You were resurrected. You ascended to glory. You're at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. You know every heart. You know every thought. You hear my prayer. You join us, and you make this place a place where your Spirit lives and reigns. And we, Lord, we bow before you. And we pray that everything that is said and done that, Lord, you made for our benefit. Lord, we pray that it would honor you, bring glory unto you. And, Lord, we pray that you would receive it and receive it well, that it would be a sweet aroma unto you, and that you would bless us with yourself. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Jerusalem was a special place. It was, it's always been that special place. It is that special place. The Christians look at Jerusalem and we know what happened there. And to us, it is very significant. The Jewish people, they're, they're, that was their capital city and it's extremely important to them. The Muslims today, they have fought over it for hundreds and hundreds, over a thousand years. They have fought over it as well and it's extremely important to them too. But in the day in which Jesus lived, it was the height, though Rome owned in the ground, ruled the earth in that place, it was a place unto God. And inside Jerusalem was a temple. And every day there were sacrifices made at the temple. Every day, seven days a week, every week, every month, every year, Every day, 365 days a year, there would be a sacrifice made at the temple. Matter of fact, there would be five sacrifices that were made every day at the temple. The first one happened at six o'clock in the morning. That was the beginning of their day, the first hour of the day to them. And it was the burnt offering. It was the offering there where a lamb will be taken and fully consumed on the offer, on the offer. Uh, altar. It was an, an offering totally roasted unto God. It was for him. It was a time of praise. It was a time of devotion. It was an offering of commitment. And I'm going to say this word. This offering called the burnt offering was an offering of total surrender. The lamb would be totally and completely offered unto the Lord. That's a thought and a concept that really is foreign to us. We come and we give to God. You've come and shown that today. You've come and out of your love and you've, you've, you've cut an hour or two hours out of your day 
You've prepared for this day. You've looked forward to this day. And we come together to worship the Lord. We sing praises unto Him. I pray from an open heart, out of love. We come and we give our offerings, our offerings of our tithe. We give our offerings of our of ourself in, in the worship of it. We come and we, we honor the preaching of the Word so that the Spirit of God can speak to us personally. It is a day of commitment unto Him. But I wonder... If in our relationship to God, we surrender what we want to surrender, or do we come and offer it all? Do any of us, as we live our day in this reflection of living in the world, living our life in this world, doing what is expected of us in our day-to-day -day life, do we still live in complete surrender to the, the, the name of Jesus, the, the thoughts of Jesus, the truths of Christ, the, the life and the truths that he preached to us, do we live in complete surrender or do we give this simply as it makes us feel good unto him? Jesus was taken from the Garden of Gethsemane by the soldiers of the high priest and was kept at night. He was treated very badly. But with in, fr in front of the chief priest, the high priest's home, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees there, they had asked him questions, they had, they had tried to bring up false witness against him, and, and nothing fit together, and the high priest had enough, and the high priest made this statement. He said, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus, at this time of the burning offerings at 6 o'clock in the morning, made this statement. He had to speak the truth, and he spoke it completely and boldly in love. He says, it is as you said. The Christ of glory, who was always there with the Father and the Spirit, let himself come in human form. He put himself in the veil the borders of the flesh, to humble himself, to live the life, to fulfill the task. Dear friends, he didn't come just to give a tithe. He came to give it all. Complete devotion. Complete and total surrender. How much better our day would be if every day we awoke in the morning with devotion of surrender to Him before we were to live our day. The second offering would happen at 9 o'clock. It was the, the grain or the meal offering. They would take grain and some of the meal, they would put it in a pan with some oil, and they would mix it up and put it over in the open fire, and the aroma would go up, and it would be smelled everywhere, and it would be uh, cooked to this place. It would not be eaten. It was simply giving of the provision back. It was a recognition of God's goodness and God's provision. And by the way, we need to stop and we need to pause. I'm very grateful for this uh, holiday that we just had, a, an offering of thanksgiving. We need to do that. But praise God, God from whom all blessings flow. We have what we have because He allows us to have what we have. And praise God for His goodness because when God gives, He gives good. They would do this every day at 9 o'clock in the morning. But by this time in Jesus' last day on earth before the cross, he was taken from the high priest home and he was taken to the Roman courts and Pilate was called out and they made their accusations against Jesus. And Pilate knew that this was done because they were envious of him. They thought it, was, it, it would be good for them if they could get Jesus out of the way. And Pilate examined him. Could you imagine the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, humbly, standing and quiet before Pilate, not arguing, not fighting, not contesting in any way. And as Pilate looked at this man, he went back to them and said, I find no fault in him. When we look at the life of Jesus, 
I find no fault in him. Jesus is the offering under God, the sweet-smelling offering. And I tell you what, one of the greatest things that can ever be said about us when we live our day and we walk our day and we surrender to God and we try to love on other people the way God taught us to, to keep God first and, and love others as much as we love ourselves. There's something special about the anointing of God that is upon us, the dripping of the Holy Spirit that is upon us when someone's around us and they just know that they're in the presence of God when they're in the presence of us. Even Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. But yet they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. And because Pilate was a politician, he made it a, something that he allowed. And Jesus was taken up Galgotha's hill by soldiers who did not know better. Simply following the rules of the day, they laid him on the cross he had already been beaten. He had been beaten with whips. He had been beaten with rods. He had been beaten with fists. They had cursed him. They spat in his face. They plucked out his beard. But he laid on that cross and they drove nails through his hands and his feet. And the one who could have stopped it all did not. And they crucified our Lord on the cross. At noon, there was a third offering that would be offered in the temple. It was called the peace offering. A part of a lamb would be taken and would be burnt. Then the rest of the lamb would be taken to, uh, for the priest to eat upon that day. Peace. Peace. It means thanksgiving. It means fellowship. It means communion. But the word peace... I apologize for giving the same definition over and over, but it's locked in my heart and I can't move away from it. When two sides are diametrically opposed and they come together, there's peace. One could be moving in this direction, 180 degrees. The other could be moving in this direction. One could be running as fast as they can to the east. The other could be running as fast as it could to the west diametrically opposed, cannot be brought together. But when something brings the two together, there's a recognition of love and communion, of fellowship, of thanksgiving, but it's called peace. And Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And the sin of me and the sin of you and the sin of all mankind was placed on the strong shoulders of our Lord. And Jesus became our sin. And Jesus shouted out those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He didn't call Him Father. He respected Him as God the Most High. And God can't look at sin. God can't look at sin. That's why it took the cross to pay for the penalty of my sin and your sin. Because He's a holy God and if He accepted sin, then He would be less than holy. It had to be paid for. It had to be redeemed. And Jesus became our, our Savior. He became our peace when sinful man and holy God came together by the shedding of the blood on the cross and the earth quaked and the sun refused to shine and darkness came over the earth at noon. At three o'clock, there was the sin offering in the temple. They would take the ox, the bull, the goat, the lamb. Once again, this would be a a burning of completion. When you see the, the sin offering there, this is the atonement for sin. When I think of this, I think of Jesus going down to where John the Baptist was baptizing. And when John saw him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But they didn't know what they meant. They didn't recognize that there. 
And Jesus paid the price. And we heard the words on the cross when he said, It is finished. Unto thy hands I commend my spirit. And he bowed his head and he gave his life. What could not be taken, he yielded willingly. Oh, what a Savior that would take for us what only he could bear, our sin offering. The six o'clock in the evening, the last of the five offerings at the temple was called the trespass offering. There are times that we sin willingly, and there are times that we sin of omission. We didn't realize it, but at some point we looked at it and we saw that that was wrong, and we said, oh, I'm sorry I did that. Uh, we repented of it as quickly as we can. Sometimes we may it may be years before we realized we sinned, but here's the thing about Christ. When he died to, and shed his blood for our sins, when it covered us in our trespasses, it covered everything that we have done, everything that we would do that day in the present tense, and listen, in a in a in a forward look, it would cover every sin that we would ever commit. Past, done. Today, complete. Future, it's already been provided for. When Jesus died on the cross, every one of my sins was in the future tense. But in the God of eternity, He died before the foundation of the world. Even before he created it, he knew that this was the path that he would go. And he willingly gave himself. And they took Jesus' body down from the cross and laid it in a borrowed tomb. How great a prize. How great a price that was paid. More than we could ever ask has been freely given the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But this was not the end. This was the beginning. This was not just ritualistic ceremonies. All of us get in the, the, the habit of ritualistic ceremonies. We do things because we're supposed to do things. And we forget it. We sing hymns so many times that, that the words cease to prick our heart as Mark this morning stopped and, and, and we had already been through that. But he said, but just remember what you just said. Did you, did you realize what you were singing unto the Lord? Let it come from here. It's new, it's fresh every day. You see, when Jesus came on Resurrection Sunday morning, He changed everything. He went from being the offering to being the living Savior. The living One. And this is where Paul gets this in, in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 20. He says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. And this wave offering, this first of the, of the three feast offerings, it says He, he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. When Jesus was resurrected, the graves opened up that day too. Just so that everybody would know. And it says in, in uh, the first part of chapter 15, in verse 3, it says, For I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that He was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and then he was seen by the twelve, that's the apostles. Then he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, and some have fallen asleep. Some have died, but most of them, you can, you can find them, you can talk to them. They saw him resurrected. Verse 7, after that he was seen by James, that's his half-brother. That's his brother of Mary and Joseph, who was not a believer until after he saw the risen Lord. Then he knew... Then he was seen by all the apostles, and Paul also adds, verse 8, then last of all was seen by me also as one born out of due time. He said, I saw him. He's resurrected. And, and, and when Jesus was alive, it was like taking the, the first fruits and saying, he's alive. Look here. Here's the beginning of the great change in our life. The first fruits. He was the first one resurrected. 
Look what it says in chapter 15, verse 23. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. See, right now, we're in this church age, this day of grace. When I was 10 years old, when I was a little boy, and I, I, I knelt at the altar, and I prayed to God, and I asked Him to do for me what I could not do. I asked Him to take away my sins, to come into my life to save me, to be my Savior and Lord. I knew the, what He had paid for me, and I had to give my life unto Him. And I did that. And, and the transaction for me on my knees before God, God saved me. He wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I am His. I'm 60 years old. It's been 50, over 50 years since then. And, and I don't know how long God's going to give me, but he could interrupt if he wants to. If he doesn't interrupt, one day I'm, gonna, I'm just going to breathe my last breath here and I'm going to say good riddance to this earth. Amen? And, and I'll, absent from the body is, say it again, present with the Lord. Amen? And it's been happening ever since Pentecost. But one day, Jesus is going to look over at Gabriel and say, hey, Gabriel, get your trumpet. Jill, you play a good trumpet. I don't think you can compare with him. Now, you can fill this room. Amen? You can fill this room, but he's going to fill the earth. And Jesus is going to come back, and the, the trumpet shall... Let, let, let's see what God's Word says about this. Look in verse number 50. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible, this that dies off, must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, there's the first. Jesus was the first fruits of resurrection. There are those Christians that will be alive when the trumpet sounds and the church will be raptured out of this place, and we will go back to glory. Then there will be a seven-year period of time called the tribulation on the earth. And at this, during that seven-year period of time, uh, Satan will be doing everything that he can as the Holy Spirit will be taken away. You know there is a holy trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Did you know there's an unholy trinity? He's a copycat. And, and Satan, the old dragon, as he's called, he will be like the opposite of God the Father. There will be Satan, the devil. And then there will be the opposite of the Christ, Jesus. There will be one called the Antichrist. And he will be the one who will want everyone on this earth to bow before him. We have the Holy Spirit, but the Antichrist will have one called the false prophet who will go out to deceive. And he will deceive many. But at the end of that time, Jesus will come down, not just to be in the clouds to, to take the raptured church back up to heaven, but we'll be coming back with him and he will come and he will put his feet on the ground and that will begin a time of rain. Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit. All of his angels will be cast into the lake of fire. And for a thousand years, Jesus will reign on this earth. Now, there will be some that did not take the mark of the beast. So they will not be killed when Jesus comes back. But there will not be believers either. And there will be those that get saved during the millennium. And it will be a wonderful time, but at the end of a thousand years, Christ will allow uh, Satan out of the bottomless pit for a season, it says. And he will go around trying to deceive as many as he can, but Christ will put an end to it. And Satan will be thrown in the lake of fire. 
All those that are unbelievers will be raised up. Come on now, listen. And they will stand before what is called in the Bible as the great white throne judgment. They will be judged by their sins and they'll be thrown eternally, separated from God in a place called the lake of fire. That's not fiction. That's not folly. That's not fairy tale. That's the truth. Satan will try everything that he can to tell you that's not the way it's going to work. Not only is he deceived, he's a deceiver. But Christ has already won. Look what Scripture says here in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 24, Then comes the end. There is that time where there will be the end. Christ was the first fruits in His resurrection. Then there will be the rapture of the church where the church will be taken to heaven. Then comes the end. The word then has two meanings. There are two different words that are translated then. The first one is E-I-T-A. It means after an interval. Something will happen after an interval in time. That's what this word then means. There is another word that they said, then this will happen, and that was the word T-O-T-E, and that means immediate. But here in verse 24, he's not saying immediately comes the end. He says after an interval of time, we know that to be a thousand years, when he delivers the kingdom to God, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power, when he puts an end to all that, and Satan is put in the lake of fire forevermore, there will never be a time where we will need anyone to reign other than our Father in heaven. It says here for, in verse 25, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The at last enemy that he will, will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who puts all things under him is accepted. And now, now when all things are made subject to him, that is Christ, then the Son himself will put also be subject to him, that is God the Father, who puts all things under him, that God may be all in all. You see how this beautifully works? They begin as three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they will end. And everyone will honor the Father. And those who chose not to receive Christ will spend their eternity separated. Where we will live in love, they will live in the opposite of that. Where we, we will live in joy, they will have no joy. Where we will have peace, there will be no peace for the unbeliever. Where we don't have to hope for hope anymore because our hope is true in sight, they will have no hope of ever having a change. That's the power of the story. That's the totality of it. And here today, as we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper, please understand and know that it's only because of Christ. So right now, in the quietness of this moment, I want you to do two things. I want the men who are to serve to come up and join us, the ordained men, if you would come join us on the front tables. But I want every head bowed. And I want you to be thinking about this life lived for Him. And if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you need to make that decision today.
Truly, all you need to do is just simply to humble your heart, pray to Him, confess to Him your sins. Tell Him your belief. And be willing to surrender your life completely and totally to Him. Ask Him to be your Savior. Let Him be your Lord. If you're already a Christian, this is a good moment to pause and Recommit your life fully and completely unto Him. No idols, no person, no place, no thing, no thought. All yielded to Him. Our Father, we come as we are, sinners in need of a Savior. And Lord, for those of us who have been wise enough to trust You and ask You to save us, we are complete in you, child of God. Lord, I know the day is coming for all of us. Either by death or by the rapture of your church. But one day, we're going to be living our forever with the decisions that we make today. Lord, I pray that we choose wisely and well. May your will be done in our life. May your will be done in this church as it is done in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Ed, would you and brought us come and prepare the table? Those who are to serve the bread, would you come at this time? Quick, stand in front. They didn't make four. They just made three.
Has everyone been served who wishes to be served? The night before the cross, Jesus gathered with his disciples to observe the Passover. At the end of the meal, he took the bread that was there to give them something that they would never forget. And he broke it and blessed it as he did other times. When he fed the 5,000, he took the bread and broke it and blessed it. And he, they found that there was never a, an end to what God did. And this was his life. And he said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me.
Has everyone been served who wishes to be served? What must have been going through the mind of Christ? The, the wine that they drank, the, the color of the blood. When he took the cup and he knew what was coming, he knew the agony, he knew the pain. We could only imagine a, as the blood would drip from his body to the ground. Every one drop was precious. But when he took the cup and he handed it to his disciples, he wanted him to remember this gift of life, this gift of hope. Scripture tells us that life is in the blood. He gave his life freely and he took it back so that we could have life more abundantly. That is our future because of him. Simply put, by the power of God, through the will of God, for the glory of God. Praise be to God. Scripture says that this cup, Jesus, Jesus' words, he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Scripture says that they um, sang a hymn and then they left the upper room to go down the Kidron Valley where the Garden of Gethsemane would be.